if you can see her. Uh, got somebody here that really, really wants to be a part of this, so I guess she'll stick around. Today I'm going to talk about something I needed to, to spend more time discussing. I've really neglected it long enough, and that's blended whiskey. In particular, the Duncan Taylor 12-year-old blended scotch whiskey. Um, you know, if you're talking about getting into scotch and whiskey in general from a new enthusiast perspective, blends are going to be the entry point for a lot of people, and with the exception of Johnny Walker Green, I've not spent really any time talking about them, so I'm going to fix that now. I think this is likely to be the first of a four-part series of probably relatively short, but hopefully still helpful, reviews of these whiskeys, starting off, like I said, with the Duncan Taylor 12-year-old, uh, probably going to do a comparison with the Black Bull 12-year-old, which is also produced, or bottled rather, by Duncan Taylor. Um, talk about the Johnny Walker Black Label, which is also a 12-year-old blend, and something that I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with, but still bears talking about. And lastly, the Syndicate 58.6 Blended Scotch Whiskey, which is a little bit of a higher price point, uh, a little bit of a different flavor profile and experience than the other three whiskeys on the table, and from, you know, a little bit different than most blends that you'll find in the 12-year-old uh, sort of entry-level price point, price range kind of thing. So, kind of an interesting comparison, but we'll get to that down the line. So, yeah, let's talk about Duncan Taylor. Uh, not a lot to say, to be honest. They started out life about 80 years ago as a Scotch whiskey broker and uh, for those of you that don't know what a whiskey broker is they are essentially third parties that will buy casks from producers and sell them to bottlers and there's like subsets of business in there like uh, you know you might facilitate buying and selling for, for small parties and things like that but uh, broadly speaking they facilitate that buying and selling right between producers and bottlers and in the case of Duncan Taylor, like with many brokers, uh, they, in the course of business, bought casks and laid them down, set them aside for their own future use, and um, built up a stock that way. So when the business was sold in 2001, no, where are you going? No, don't stay up there. The business was sold in 2001. They decided that they were going to move up in the Speyside region and in that area become less of a broker and more of an independent bottler and really focus on that business and uh, over the last 16, 17 years that's what they've done and their range of products that you'll see in the market has certainly steadily grown I've noticed that myself even having only paid attention for the last few years you'll see a number of different blends from them a number of different labels of single malt independent bottles um, but yeah let's talk about the blend Unlike Diageo, uh, you know something so large and well known that even though they might not publish what's actually in the blend, you probably have a pretty good idea of what the constituent parts are for many of their blends. Um, in this case, I have no idea. Couldn't find any information on it. it. Certainly doesn't say on the labeling. No clue. I mean, it's almost certainly largely, uh, or not largely, but has a good proportion of grain whiskey in there. But from what distilleries the the distillate comes from, I have no idea. I can tell you it's bottled at 40%. Certainly it's chill filtered, probably colored. And uh, I don't know what else there is to say. So let's give it a go. Uh, it's very light on the nose. There's no question about it. And you know, as I mentioned early on, this is sort of an entry level experience for a lot of people. So you would expect it to be approachable. It's not going to punch you in the face. It's not going to challenge you unduly. And it's almost certainly going to be a little bit sweet. So, so yeah, it's sweet, sugary sweetness, but also a surprising level of vegetal peat. Uh, and it's important to distinguish that from sort of the the booming campfire smoke of like the Isla single malts. It's not at all like that. It's more like the light vegetal smoke of a Highland Park, uh, for instance. More prominently than I would have expected, to be honest with you. Beyond that, there's a vanilla note. There's a cereal malty note to it. There's some light fruits as well. Sort of like a, uh, a, a fresh green apple, fresh pear, some light red fruits. Like a red currant, perhaps. 
Oh no, I mean it's it's certainly inoffensive, it's quite pleasant on the nose, but let's see what it's like on the palate. Kind of as you would expect from the nose. Um, quite light. It's not a hefty whiskey. It doesn't settle heavily on your tongue. It's very sweet immediately. Very sweet on the arrival. Not not the honeyed note that I often talk about. It's um, it's much more refined sugar, kind of like a vanilla frosting note. Because that vanilla note is definitely evident now on the palate. Um, the peat fades away very quickly after the arrival doesn't play as large a role as I would have expected based on the nose. The maltiness is still there. Quite pleasantly actually, it's quite nice. Um, and the fruity notes are still there. Yeah, the apple note, definitely prominent. Um, the red fruit comes through more now. Kind of like a strawberry. I had said red, red currant before, also a little bit of a raspberry hint to it. And there's a, an oaky bite, something that sort of like catches you in the back of the cheek there. Not really spicy at all, but uh, kind of like zesty. I don't know what that is, whether it's uh, attributable to a little bit of time in an oak cask, a little bit too much time, I'm not sure. It's not unpleasant, it's just kind of a little bit of, a, little bit of a bite. The finish is not long, it's kind of short and subdued. Like I said, there's all the spice to speak of, so it's mostly just a sweet and malty note that lingers through a little bit, but as I said, not particularly long. And um, yeah, on the whole, you know what, it's pretty good. I think it actually compares very favorably to the Johnny Walker Black Label, which as I said is probably one of the best known 12 year old blends on, on the planet. Um, it's not quite as hefty, it's got a slightly different profile as far as the peatiness of it. The notes are definitely lighter um, than, the, than the Johnny Walker, and so for that reason, you know, Johnny, you could probably put over ice, no problem, you could drink it neat if you want to, you could put it as part of a cocktail. I would never put this over ice, I would never add more than a drop of water to it if you're so inclined, because it is very light, right? Like I said, it's bottled at 40%, but even beyond that, the, the profile, it's not heavy-handed, it's not hefty, and I think if you were to dilute it much at all, you'd probably kill it. Um, I mean, it would serve well in a lot of cocktails, It's uh, it's got that kind of profile to it, but I paid $27 for this bottle, and it's important to note the price point on these because when I'm going to talk about the score of it, if I score this a certain point, I mean, let's do that first, you know what, let's just do that first. I'd be inclined to give this like an 84 out of 100, um, and here's where I wanted to specify the price point aspect of it, because an 84 for a 27 dollar, no, you're back, are you? Hello. An 87, <laughs> oh, you're killing me, cat. Let's rewind that a, a second or two. And a score of 84 on a 27 dollar bottle of whiskey is not going to be... Uh, the same as a score of 84 on uh, even an $80 bottle of whiskey, never mind a $200 bottle of whiskey or on up from there. In the same way that uh, when you score a bottle of wine, uh, the price point and the sort of tier of wine that you're, you're looking at is important to note when you're evaluating what that score actually means. I think it's important to note that uh, when you're talking about whiskey as well. I mean, quality is important. There's no question about it, but I don't think you can ignore the cost of things either. It would be a fool's errand to to try and look at a bottle that's ten times more expensive to this and compare it heads up with this. I mean, it just it's just not going to work out for you. So, yeah, um, eighty-four to one hundred, well worth the time. I'm happy to have, have uh, found this. I think it's worth the twenty-seven dollars and probably more. Uh, that said, Duncan Taylor, please don't increase the price. It's good. Give it a try. Uh, if you wanted something approachable, something to have on hand, either for cocktails or to give to people uh, that maybe aren't whiskey drinkers themselves, but might like brandy, might like cognac, I think this is a great, uh, easy sipper to have on hand. It's also a great thing just to have on hand for um, for uh, like a summer's evening because it is so light and it is a little bit fruity 
and sweet. Uh, great evening sipper in warmer weather. So, like I said, I'm happy to have tried it. And uh, I think shortly we'll talk about how it compares to other other blends. I think next up, likely the Black Bull. As I said earlier, also a Duncan Taylor release, but something that has a very different profile to it. And uh, I'll be interested to uh, that really highlight that in the next video. So, cheers, guys. Yeah.